In this screencast, I'm going to explain the difference between something known as a sampling distribution and something known as a population distribution. This is probably one of the most important screencasts for understanding hypothesis testing that we're going to get to in the coming weeks. A population distribution, if we took a population outlined by this blue shape here, and we took samples of size 1, n equals 1, and if we did that many, many times, what would result is a population distribution. And we've been talking about this now for a couple of weeks now. If we took individual items and we compiled a histogram and then we fit that to a normal distribution, we would get this red line. A sampling distribution is a little bit different. We have our population, again outlined by this blue shape, but we took samples of n equals, for example, 5 here. So we took samples of size greater than 1. If we did this and we computed the average of those n items, and we repeated this many times, we could generate a distribution of the statistic x bar, which is the sample average. We do this again. We have another sample of size n. We compute the average and we keep going. And maybe we do this something like six times. But if you were to do this many, many times, you would come up with something known as a sampling distribution x1, x2 through xn are a random sample of size n if the xi's are independent random variables and every xi has the same probability distribution. A statistic is any function of the observations in a random sample. The probability distribution of a statistic is called a sampling distribution. So here we're going to take the sample average of samples of size n. Sample average is a statistic and then we're making a probability distribution of the sample average, and that's a sampling distribution of x bar. In order to understand the analysis of sampling distributions, we have to first consider linear functions of random variables. If we had a variable y, that's a linear function, a linear combination of x1, x2, all the way up to xp, and we have these coefficients, c1, c2, etc. The mean of y is just c1, the constant there, multiplied by the average of x1 plus the same thing for all of the other terms. So really, so really what this means is if y is composed of a linear combination of a bunch of different variables, the mean is going to be related similarly. The variance is a little bit different because we have to square those constants. So the variance of y is equal to c1 squared times the variance of 1 squared and so on. And it's a linear combination. By the way, we're not going to talk too much about this, but if the x's are not independent, then you would have to include the covariance here. For the most part, in this class, we're going to be considering linear combinations, and they're independent. The x's are independent. So let's take a look at the sampling distribution. x bar, you know, is just the average. We sum all the x values, the xi's, and we divide by n. You can think of this as all of the ci's in the previous slide are equal to 1 over n. And therefore, the mean, or the expected value, just becomes the mean. So mathematically, that n just cancels out. However, if you look at the variance, the variance of x bar becomes the variance of your randomly distributed variable divided by n. So the n does not cancel out because of this n squared that we have in the denominator. So importantly, the sampling distribution of a random sample of normally distributed random variables is also a normal distribution with the same mean, but the variance has been reduced by a factor of n. And that's really important for sampling distributions. This red line here represents the population distribution. And a sampling distribution is always going to be narrower than the population distribution. And that's because we have divided the variance of our population by n in order to get the variance of x bar. In fact, if we continue to increase the size of our sample, here the green is showing a sample of size 20, we narrow the probability density even more. Let's take a look at an example. A pharmaceutical company makes pills. They claim that the population average is 100 milligrams and the population standard deviation of these pills is 1.2. We find, so we just go and we weigh one single pill, and it's 99.5 milligrams. Is this rare? Do we have evidence to accuse the company that their pills are significantly less than 100 milligrams as they advertise? Because we found a pill that's 99.5 milligrams. 
Another way of looking at this is how probable is it that based upon the mean and standard deviation above and claimed by the company that we get a single pill that weighs less than or equal to 99.5 milligrams. So this is a bit of a review. You guys have done this before. We can calculate the probability that X is less than or equal to 99.5. We can convert this to a Z value. We can look this up in the tables and we can find that the probability of this occurring of getting a pill less than or equal to 99.5 milligrams that occurs about 33.8% of the time. We could also use Excel to solve this problem. And the question is, is this rare? And in fact, this is not rare. 33% of the time, we would expect to find pills that are less than or equal to 99.5 milligrams in mass. In other words, if we looked at this graphically, the probability that our pill weight is less than or equal to 99.5 would be about 0.338. So that happens almost 34% of the time. However, what if we took an average of five samples and the average of five samples was 99.5? How probable is it, based upon the mean and standard deviation claimed by the company, that we get an average of five pills of less than or equal to 99.5 milligrams? So not a single pill, but an average of five pills. How often does that happen? So we find an average to be 99.5. We can do the same type of analysis there's a couple differences here. Now, instead of just X, we're looking at X bar. So we're looking at the sampling distribution or the distribution of X bar. We can convert this to a Z value, 99.5 minus 100. And now, instead of just dividing by sigma, we divide by sigma over root N because that's the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. And when we do the analysis here, we find that the probability is about 0.176. We can also do this in Excel. I think I forgot a parenthesis there. An average of five samples less than or equal to 99.5 happens about 18% of the time. This isn't significantly rare. It occurs 18% of the time if the mean really is 100 milligrams. So here we really couldn't conclude that we are being cheated by the company. In other words, 99.5, if we looked at the sampling distribution, so this is looking at X bar, the probability density of X bar when N equals five, that occurs about 18% of the time. Now let's look at the uh, far extreme here. We look at 20 samples, N equals 20, and we find the average to be 99.5. Is there evidence that the company might be falsely advertising? We can analyze this, the average of 20 samples to be 99.5, convert this to a Z value, and we're getting the probability that the average of 20 samples is less than 99.5. This only occurs 3% of the time. So if we found an average of 20 samples to be 99.5, this is also known as a p-value, and you'll learn more about that later in the course. But this only occurs 3% of the time. And in this case, we would probably conclude that this is rare. This is less than a common acceptable risk level of about 5%. And here we have evidence that pill weight is significantly less than the claimed average of 100 milligrams. These sampling distributions are going to be the foundation for a lot of the hypothesis testing that we're going to talk about in this course. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about population distributions and sampling distributions and their importance in this screencast.